All right, welcome everybody. This is. Uh, I, love your background. <laughs> I love your background. Uh, hey. Welcome to York Schools Code and Design class. Today's April twentieth, twenty twenty, and today we have York School alumnus Blake Bennett, class of 08, and uh, user experience researcher at Google, who's agreed to tell us a little bit about his experience at Google. Um, first of all, Blake. It's so great to see you. I don't. I, I can't remember the last time I saw you, but it's it's yeah. been a while. And and thank you for for joining us. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I'm glad I'm glad I was able to uh, make it in. You caught me at a good time because I just finished my big project last Friday, and then we're doing we're starting the next stuff tomorrow. So you hit me on a good pause day where I wasn't too overloaded with stuff. Oh, um, good. I'm sure they keep you busy there at Google, even remotely. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, they so give I, you. Go. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so I, I was able to find a deck kind of last minute that I adjusted that has a lot of sort of UX general stuff, and I made some slight modifications, but it's not my deck. But um, yeah, I figure I can go through it um, sort of quickly because it answers some of the questions I saw you already had. Um, if anyone has other questions, it sounds like you can just add it to that Google sheet, um, and I, we can make sure go through at the end. Um, should we try and get this in a half hour? Is an hour, or how much time do I have? So we'll. Um... We'll excuse people in a half hour if you okay. want to stick around and answer, you know, other questions. Um, I, I'm often here for about an hour into my class, but if anyone needs to leave at two thirty, and Blake, whenever you need to leave, feel free to to hop out. But we'd okay. we'd love to have you as long as we get to have you. Um, let me yes. just give you a brief background in in what this class is. It's called Code and Design, and it's a a uh, combination of uh, introduction to computer programming and product development class. So we all get some basic exposure to computer programming principles, um, but the meat of what we do is design thinking and look at using technology to create products that solve real world problems. And so we fan out into our community and try to um, create products that solve problems that are of need in our community. We also um, so, classes. what's that? We've also taught classes instead of creating stuff. That's right. That's right. Teach classes about computer programming. Basically, have a have a positive impact on our community using the design thinking process. Awesome. Um, so it's very well aligned with with the work that you're doing. And so, yeah, our first question was kind of to get a sense of your journey from York School to Google. If if you'd like to start there, or you want to go somewhere else. That's fine too. Yeah, no, I, I, that is the first slide I have, so I'll just go ahead and pop this up so there's a little bit of a visual aid alongside everything else. Excellent. Um, yeah, so I can go explode this so you can see it. Yeah, so this, this was my kind of overview journey to where I am today over the past, I guess, 12 years now. Um, so yeah, I started at York Schools, as, as Kevin said, I was class of 08. I immediately fell into undergrad at the Claremont McKenna College, which is down in Claremont near LA, if you're familiar. Um, I did two degrees, so I did psychology and German studies. Um, so I kind of combined both of those and went to go study more psychology in Germany. Uh, so I got a scholarship uh, to Ludwig Maximilian University. It's the big public university in Munich. Um, I was studying experimental psychology with a focus on tech, which, as you can imagine, kind of you can see where that led, to, led me. Um, so I did my master's there. My first job after academia was at a startup called User Testing. Um, they do what's called remote usability testing primarily. Um, so helping a lot of research-based stuff all remotely with people across the globe, um, working with different companies who use the company as a research tool effectively. I was there for about two years. Um, then for three years, I was at a company called Tata Consulting Services. You've probably never heard of them, but they're basically the biggest tech company in India. Um, they're kind of like the Google of India to a certain extent. Um, they work on a lot of companies you've heard of, but you know it's their name associated, like Wells Fargo, um, several car companies, a lot of like big companies use them for backend stuff, essentially. Um, and for that company, I was actually doing, coincidentally enough, uh, design thinking work. So basically, we were a design thinking studio. Uh, so we worked with big Fortune 100 companies who were trying to do something innovative or interesting in the user space, uh, brought them in, helped them kind of come up with new ideas, new product concepts, things they can do to sort of stand out in their field and bring that from the like ideation stage to the MVP, which like, you know, most minimal viable product stage. And then they could take it back to their, you know, CEOs and stuff. Hey, we want to do this. This is the research and like work with them so far. Um, so I was there for about three years. And then this past December, um, so about four months ago, um, I moved over to Google. Um, I now work on the assistant team. So if any of you use Google Assistant, um, I work on people who work on that. Um, and basically, I work on the consumer experience side of things. Uh, right now, I'm 
leading up a project that's called Scaled Verticals, and that's basically come up with new concepts that Assistant currently doesn't do. Uh, so trying to find new areas where Assistant can be helpful to people in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, how, yeah. That's fascinating. How did how, how did uh, you get in this direction? Like, how did you know about user experience, and how did you get excited about it? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so while I was at in school, um, just to be super super honest, it wasn't an, I was, you know, all through undergrad, I had no idea what I was going to do. Basically, in my senior year, I applied to a bunch of different things, including the um, the scholarship I ended up getting to go to my graduate degree. I decided getting a master's for free was probably a pretty cool idea, plus let me live abroad for two <laughs> years, you know, without kind of coming out of pocket. Uh, so I decided to follow that opportunity. Um, and then it wasn't until my second year of my master's um, where I still had no idea what to do after I graduated. I was still really <laughs> perplexed. Um, the entire time I was an undergrad, like when I was doing psychology stuff, my focus, my personal project was always on the intersection of technology and social behavior. Um, so I was always interested in kind of how things like video games and social networking and things like that were affecting our lives and how we behave with each other. Um, and so, yeah, halfway through my graduate program, I had a friend who was working at Dropbox, as I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. And he's like, hey, have you ever thought about being a UX researcher? And I was like, what is that? I've never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he kind of described it. And I was like, wait, that sounds a lot like the kind of research I'm doing. It sounds like it's like putting people in front of technology, seeing how they react and how they behave. And he's like, yep, that's basically it. Um, so for me, it was actually a really easy transition. The way I kind of characterize it is that in my academic career, I was looking at people and technology and seeing how people react. And now I'm looking at people and technology and thinking about how do we change the technology to make it better for people. Um, so kind of like a small pivot based on that kind of intersection. So are you doing things like even down to the level of like tracking eyeballs when they're using uh, technology? Yeah, so we do, a, there's a lot of different methods. Um, it's pretty, I can go into some more detail, but we do everything from actual analytical stuff. So like you said, we've, we've, I haven't personally do that much of it, but some researchers do a lot of stuff for like eye tracking and motion capture, things like that. Uh -huh. All the way to some more high level, like looking and just having interviews and just trying to understand if people want things to work or how they currently do things. So it can be anything on that whole range of like opinions to actual analytical data. That's cool. Yeah. So t tell us a little bit about what your average work day at Google as a user experience researcher is like? Yeah, um, so that's it's a great question. Uh, my days tend to vary a lot just because of the uh -huh. nature of my work. Um, as you might imagine, it's very project focused because it tends to be sort of broken up into various research projects. Um, the short answer is a lot of my days meetings. Uh, Google is a very meeting heavy company, even more so than previous companies I've worked at, um, just because it's very cross collaboration based. Um, in order to do that, you have to be in meetings with the people you're collaborating with. Uh, so whether that's other designers, engineers, writers, um, you know, project managers, uh, program managers, all those kinds of things, um, I tend to have a, a lot of those, plus meetings with the other researchers and the teams I belong to. <laughs> um, because of the nature of my work, um, there's a lot fewer researchers to every designer, and there's a lot, lot fewer designers to every engineer. Um, so that means that as a researcher, I'm servicing multiple teams usually. Um, so right now I'm working with about four discrete teams on a on a week-to-week -week basis. Um, so again, a lot of that means keeping up with what they're doing, making sure I'm aware of what's going on, making sure that I'm being proactive and able to look ahead to see what I need to be doing to help them be successful. Um, mm -hmm. That's a lot of it. Um, so besides the meeting stuff, then in a given day, I'm working on whatever stage of the project's at. So that could be, so the rough overline is sort of like scoping, figuring out what we're doing, how we're doing it, who we're doing it with. For instance, we're doing a survey with North American assistant users, or we're doing a usability study in, in a lab where people are coming in and trying out a product that we're considering launching or something like that. Um, so we can be scoping, then a lot of it tends to be recruitment and planning, so figuring out all the logistics side of things and what we're asking them, um, actually conducting research, so sort of deploying a survey, running a, running a session, all those kinds of things, um, doing analysis, writing a report, um, and then presenting. Um, so that depending on what projects I'm attached to and what stage that, that tends to be my like head down desk space time. Um, uh -huh. That's kind of the general things I'm doing on a week to week basis. And you're working specifically on Google Assistant, right? Correct. Yeah. And so for those of you who don't, don't know, uh, that's the software that will kind of answer your verbal questions. There's also a, you could type into Google Assistant as, as well, but we, we tend to think of it as as uh, the voice assistant when we say, hey, G-O-O-G-L-E, and ask a question, right? Correct. And uh, so can you 
can you tie to any specifics, like what sort of problem, like what uh, example of a problem that you've been faced to uh, research and solve with yeah, regard to that software? Yeah, absolutely. And again, like the stuff I tend to work on tends to be very, it's not, there's about actually 30 full-time researchers working on assistant right now. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of us and we're working on various different things. Like the researcher focuses just on the auto experience. So things you're doing while you're driving. There's a person who focuses wow. just on the family experience, people who are you know using a lot with children or in a family context. Wow. Uh, there's people who focus on specific devices, so like just your phone or just smart displays or just smart speakers. So um, we're kind of over the place. Again, mine's a bit weird because I'm, I'm kind of I'm much more broad. And again, it's, it's all focused on things that are kind of things that don't exist yet, but trying to figure out whether, whether to make them exist, and if so, how. <laughs> uh, so a, a lot of my challenges, uh, believe it or not, is just sort of figuring out that first stage, just like, is this worth making? Um, uh. So there's a, a lot of things we could be doing out there. Um, you know, a lot of things that just, we could spend time doing. Um, as you can imagine, like, even though Google's a huge company, there's still only so much resources, both money and people and everything else in a given, you know, year to work on. Um, so having to figure out, like, where do we, where do we going to best What's our best use of resources so we can be the most impactful and help the most people on a day-to-day -day basis or week-to-week -week basis or month-to-month -month basis and things like that? Um, and so an example right now is actually um, kind of tying into, and there's a question later about the current coronavirus situation. Um, as a whole organization, Google for the past month has been like, okay, like we need to pause our non-essential work and figure out how do we help people during this coronavirus experience? Um, so as I'm sure a lot of you realize, a lot of people's first step of trying to find information is go to Google and type something in. So <laughs> right. you know, Google, how do we get them the help they need in a trustworthy manner so they can be making smart decisions about how to handle this pandemic? Um, so systems no different. We're doing a lot of things where we're trying to adjust our workflows. Uh, so basically, a lot of the work I paused on was things that weren't necessarily super vital right now. And now we're, we're trying to rapidly put out a bunch of tools to help people who are having trouble with the coronavirus. Uh, so for instance, we're doing some stuff with education. So how do we help, how do we help learners at home stay up to date on their communication? How do we help parents set schedules so we can consistently stay on tasks? How do we help them get their educational resources when they don't have direct access to their teachers? Uh, things like that. Also things like getting out um, you know, tools to help you figure out, you know, am I, do I think I'm getting sick? If I'm getting sick, what do I do? What are my resources available to me? Um, so do you uh, have people asking assistant if they have COVID-19? Yeah, so I think both Siri, both Siri, yeah, Siri, Alexa, and Assistant are all getting those questions on a regular basis. Oh my goodness, that's crazy! Uh, yeah, it, it's really interesting because I, you know, I can't go into super specifics, but just like the rate of usage for digital assistants generally is kind of wild. Because you have, I, and just to be like super blunt, like for me, I'm someone who I have an iPhone for my personal phone, and I basically just use Siri in my car. Like that's it. I'm not a big like power voice assistant user. Uh, uh -huh. How you dare you? People who like definitely view like their system as like as their like their friend and it's like they talk yeah. to them like multiple times a day especially if you have smart home devices you're using it all the time to like do stuff when you don't want to pull your phone out and things like that and then especially again i think google has an association of just like google knows things um so this is an expe expectation that google should be able to help me with a medical question if i have one come up that's uh, that's amazing have you noticed that 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 some people are actually finding comfort in maybe people who are alone right now are using Google Assistant to just kind of have a social experience? Yeah, I, I actually don't have data on that, so I'm not sure. Right. I, I would be surprised <laughs> if that's the case. Uh, I'm just thinking about that movie, Her. I can't, I can't stop <laughs> thinking about that. It's such a crazy yeah. movie. I don't know if it's gotten that far, but I... I um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Francis yeah. just posted in the chat that everyone is uh, all of your her assistants are going crazy because we're we're using the trigger word. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, because I have all of them except for Siri because we hate because I hate Apple. I have Cortana, <laughs> Alexa, and Google. Alexa, stop. Yeah, uh, Francis gets a little religious on the uh, technology debate between Apple, Google, and Amazon. Um, <laughs> So I want to go back. You said you spent a lot of time in meetings, and and for some yeah. people that might be pretty surprising because meetings get kind of a bad rap in the innovative corporate culture. Like, does this really need to be a meeting? But it's interesting that that you guys do a lot of meetings, and I wonder if you have any insight in how your meetings maintain their efficacy. Yeah, um, that's that's a great question. Um, uh, let me see if I can find a good example of something that. Um, 
Here, I can, uh, I'm going to switch my screen real quick. If I mm -hmm. So you can see an example, like this is, um, <laughs> this was my, this was a couple weeks ago, this was my week. You can see how many meetings, this is any of the white spaces don't have I had free time to actually do stuff. <laughs> the rest of it was me basically involved with other things. So like, that's a rough idea of like what an average week looks like for me. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, and are yeah. these all meet meetings basically now? Uh, so a, a lot of them are in person actually. So it varies based on the team. Um, you know, some teams are more distributed. Uh, my team's actually mostly in Mountain View, so we tend to be pretty in person. Um, I think all of our meetings, we always open a meet meeting just in case someone's, you know, can't make it in or is, is right. home for the day or things like that. So we, we always have meet open, but a lot of times it's all everyone's in person anyway. Uh, but again, that depends on the team. It depends on everything like that. Um, uh, yeah, kind of to your point, there are a lot of guidelines and recommendations on how to stay effective with meeting because a lot of people do tend to get overwhelmed. And I think there is, you know, there's a big question of just like, we're supposed to always be like, yeah, like, should this be a meeting? Should this be us discussing things, quote, offline? Um, right. Right. Should it be handled some other way? Um, even with that caveat, a lot of meetings still happen. Um, just because I think a lot, like you know, a lot of times face-to-face -face interaction is just going to be more effective in some ways than email chains back and forth. Because we also get a lot of emails, and so if you send an email and someone has 50 other emails in the last hour in their inbox, you might not get a response as quickly. Um, so it's kind of a weird balancing act between all those things. Um, in terms of making a good meeting, I think we have some general rules, and that's like you want to have a really clear objective coming into the meeting. Um, it's also discouraged to ever have meetings over a half hour. Um, I think part of that yeah, is like if you feel time pressure, you stay effective and on task a lot more quick, efficiently. I love uh, that. Yeah. So so having um, that, we also have a lot of um, you know posters up and things about how to you know make sure you're having respectful and inclusive meetings. So making sure that you're not talking over people, that you're trying to recognize teammates who are maybe in the meet meeting rather than in person with you, um, that you're you know not accidentally quashing ideas or like we can get a non-inclusive environment. Um, so th those, like in every meeting room, we actually have little like signs about that kind of stuff just to refresh yourself on like, these are good meeting habits to be having. Um, so there's a lot of kind of just like constant sort of learning going on of just like, here's the things you should be doing in meetings. Um, and huh. it's a sort of environment to be like, make sure you call, like be proactive in speaking up if you see things not being done the way they're supposed to. Right, right. I, I just, uh... I watched an interview with Elon Musk, and one of the things that they do in in the Tesla culture is they have lots of meetings as well. But but they have a understanding that if you're in a meeting and you don't feel like your time is absolutely necessary to be there, not only are you encouraged to leave, or is it okay for you to leave, but you're you're expected to leave if you don't feel like at that moment it's the best use of your time. That was really provocative to me, and I've never heard of that. Have you, has that uh, does does that culture is that in Google at all? Yeah, I, I don't think it's quite that explicit, but I think there's an expectation that if someone declines a meeting or doesn't like go to something, it's it's never personal. Like if you, it's like, a good reason that they choose. Yeah, a good reason. I think there's also like everyone. Basically, Google has access to everyone else's calendars. So you can see everyone's calendars. You can move events even if you didn't make them. Like those are all just on by default. So there's yeah, a lot of just cool. like, oh, I can't make this time. I'm moving this, and like, like, hey, like, I can't. Like, I'm moving this because quick reason or things like that. Um, right. So, so there's an open culture of just sort of like adding or moving around meetings as necessary based on priorities and things like that, instead of like saying no or yes, like and giving reasons for it. Um, like for instance, I have a meeting tomorrow. I'm meeting at a presentation, and one of our senior designers is like, "Hey, I can't make this. this is, can you please record this so I can watch it later?" Like doing things like that are very accepted and understood. That's cool. Hey, we've got a we've got a good group here, and I want to just make sure that anyone I, I I did post a doc for people to post questions, but if you know you have a question that comes up, feel free to raise your hand or just unmute yourself and and uh, jump in if you have any questions for Blake. Um, yeah, no, six, I think I'm going to get the rest of these as well, but I'm happy to talk about whatever is most helpful right now. Yeah, I've got a list of questions, so there's no there's no shortage in what I want to, to hear from Blake, but I also want all of you students to feel uh, welcome to just interrupt and say, hey, I really want to want to know this. Which is very googly. So. It'd be, is that googly as well? <laughs> cool. Um, <laughs> it's, it's no secret. I'm, I'm perhaps the biggest Google fanboy in the world. Yeah. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm really admire what the work that you all do and, and uh, the mission that you all have to make the world's information universally accessible. Um, mm -hmm. I just feel like every, our lives in, in many ways are so much better. Um, oh, you got some more slide deck. You wanna, yeah. you wanna go through? Oh, there it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and useful. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. You want to talk about that at all? The yeah. Yeah. I mean, I again, it's kind of it's interesting because I think it all kind of ties into like what how we sort of think about UX, especially at Google. Um, and that's you know, there, there's a couple different ways of thinking about it. The first one's like make it easy to use. Um, that's a big one. Um, you know, we have some I have some slides later about how Google used to not be very easy to use, and it's been trying to make sure you think about that more. Um, you know, making sure like people figure out why people like you like the products we do. Like, what are we doing right, to get, and how do we keep doing that? Right. Um, and then it's, I think a big one of that, like, you know, like I kind of view as my big role is not, not just understanding our customers, but having empathy and making sure that we're understanding why they want things and what they have to do things. Um, I know you had one of your questions later about like, how much do we think about privacy? Um, the answer is like, for me, a lot. Um, mm -hmm. One of those things where like, you know, I, I'm a pretty privacy conscious individual. I know I might not be the most privacy. I might, I know I might not be the least privacy minded, but I know I'm also not the most, uh, but it's something that I think about. Like I, I've gone through my security system, my settings on my personal Gmail, you know, Google account and like change things in my privacy settings because I care about that kind of thing. Um, I remember that about yeah. you when you were in my class, like you really were someone who really thought about those individual rights and uh, implications when we were talking about history. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, I mean, it's, again, it's one of those things where like, it's, you know, it's hard because I think when you think about Google, when you think about Microsoft, you think about Amazon, it's easy to think about, you know, like Jeff, just Jeff Bezos or just, you know, like, that like, you know, big people names. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard because, you know, some decisions do get made from the top down. Uh, but my kind of perspective being, you know, working in tech for as many years as I have is like, you know, a lot of people at my level do think about these things. And even if we don't always get the decisions we want, we're obviously advocating for them. Um, and so for instance, there's something that I'm working on right now. Um, is it basically a change to a system that I can't speak to yet, but the kind of like my team, basically a team was like, we're gonna make this thing, like we're, gonna, we're doing this thing, hooray. And then my team was like, wait, 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 there's like huge privacy implications here and security <laughs> concerns here that people might have, like we need to stop and think about this. Um, and so we actually basically paused that project to like, hey, like we need to do some research with our users, make sure and see how they feel about this we move forward. Um, Cause this is like, we don't wanna alienate, you know, any percentage of our users by making this change. Um, and so we kind of paused that. I went and spoke to a large number of our users. Um, so I sort of surveyed a bunch of people. Then I had sort of hour long interviews with about 10 more of them to sort of get more detailed instructions. And sort of basically just, hey, like we're thinking about changing this thing. Um, um, here's an example, go and try using it. Okay, now let's talk about what you like, what you don't like. Do you have concerns about privacy, security? How about, do you think people in your household have privacy, security, things like that? Um, and I kind of brought that back to the team. And in this case, luckily, everyone was just like, no, we don't care. We, we like this feature. Please make this. Um, but, you know, that, that was an opportunity. So it's like, you know, like, we need, like, if we're, if we're doing our job right as UX practitioners, is that we're the people who should be watching out for that kind of thing. We should be calling the alarm. We should be saying, hey, like, wait, like, are we thinking, is this just best for Google or is this best for Google's users as well? Um, and so, like, I, I definitely view my job as a researcher to be kind of the, the thing we often say is, like, we're the voice of the user in the room. We're the people mm -hmm. representing the average person out there using it who is not thinking about how does this make us the most money or how does this make us the most famous. It's thinking about how do we keep our users happy and feeling safe and secure, even if they're not thinking about it at the time. Yeah, because your users at almost the drop of a hat could could switch to Siri or Alexa or just decide... Hey, we don't want to use any of these assistants anymore. Dang it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I, I think it's one of the things too, where like it's very easy, you know, if you're if you're at a startup, it's one thing, but you know, Google and you see something just like, oh, you know, like, you know, like only like most people like this, but 0.01% of people really hate this and like that's okay. It's not because that 0.01 is still millions and millions of people considering how many products Google has that have <laughs> over users. Um, so like eat something that's a one percent problem point is potentially affecting millions of people's days, which is not something to easily forget. And it's obviously like, it's a big responsibility because there is a very strong expectation that Google is going to do right by most people. Again, I know a lot of com a lot of companies in tech have taken a bit of a morale hit recently in terms of public perception. Um, but again, I, I think my team still believes very strongly in our mission to try and say here, like, you know, think about our users, that should be our, our, our big thing. And everything else will kind of, if we're doing that right, everything will work, work itself out. Um, so I have to I have to ask this. Yeah. There have been a lot of people who think that either Alexa or Siri or Google that they're just people like pretty smart people. People I admire yeah. say I'm pretty sure they're listening to us all the time because I just mentioned something that I never talk about yeah. uh, and never search, and then an ad popped up on my screen. Do you have any response to that? Do you know what I'm saying? 
Yeah, I know exactly. So I, I cannot speak for Siri. I cannot speak for Alexa. I definitely cannot speak for Facebook because I don't have any idea what they're doing on their end. Right, right. All, all I can say is we actually, I think we actually just put out a commercial this past December, specifically around that point. Uh -huh. um, and basically um, the short answer is it's weird, <laughs> um, but Google Google is always listening on its on the device itself. Locally, um, yeah. Basically it's listening to recognize the phrase, hey, G. Right. Then, um, so even though it is always listening, it's not saving it or sending it anywhere. Um, uh -huh. The only time that stuff gets sent is when it gets activated and you say something to it. Um, now, obviously, it gets more complex because if it gets accidentally activated, which we try and avoid, but like can you know can happen sometimes. Just like in our meeting right now, if I was say, yeah, it'd be, like it start listening even though I didn't mean it to listen. Um, right. So like that can get kind of complicated. Um, and it's one of those things where like yes, that information is getting sent and it's getting analyzed. But to my knowledge, we're not we're not changing our behavior. Based on what you say or do, um, it's usually more just like we're we're analyzing it to give you the response you need, and sometimes we're taking it to make sure, like, hey, like, did we give the right response? Like, was it parsing what you said correctly? We're using it to improve our speech algorithms, things like that. Um, but I I am not aware of any program whatsoever that's doing personalization based on continually listening to you throughout the day. <laughs> I, I, I I'm sure they're not, but yeah, who knows what the other the other uh, platforms are doing. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What do we got next here? Um, let's talk about. I know that you know Dominic asked about becoming, you know, working at Google. I, I'm I'm really curious about uh, the interview process. What was that like? To sure. And it, is that scale to one ten question? Is that um is that how difficult is it to become employed by Google, or is it how difficult is it to be to be a Google employee once you get past that point? Dominic, unmute yourself and answer that question. If you can, oh, he might have gotten booted off. I don't know what he meant, but I know I'd like to hear the answer to both questions. <laughs> yeah, let's, that's, uh, that's totally yeah, no, not at all. Um, I think there, yeah, there's some slides here about how to how to work at Google, so I can switch, switch those. Um, oh, do you have? Yeah, I have my hat over there somewhere. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So the the first question of how difficult it is. Um, Google is one of the most Difficult employers to get into. It's not. I don't know if it's the most important, but it is very difficult. I think on average, most people apply to uh, go through the application process at Google three to four times before getting in, if they get in at all. Mm -hmm. um, so very rigorous. Uh, Google, Google in general would rather reject good candidates than accidentally accept a bad candidate. Um, so mm -hmm. they have a higher tolerance for false, false negatives and false positives, effectively. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of those things. Um, when, one of the things I always say is that. I, I kind of warn people when they're going through the application processes is that ultimately this is a number out of just a personal opinion, but like ultimately only 60 to 70 percent of you getting a job has to do with you. Um, there's always going to be some percentage of stuff that has to do with the other candidates, what has to do with funding, things like that. I know a lot of you are probably thinking ahead to applying to colleges is the same kind of thing. Like you can be a perfect candidate and not get into a given school because of reasons outside of your control. Um, all you can do is really maximize the percentage that you have to go through. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just like if you don't get through it, it might not be you, um, which it doesn't help. But like it, I think it's genuinely true. Um, I think, for example, you know, getting this job um, at Google, I was also applying to a few other places, so things like Facebook, um, LinkedIn, some other like big name companies. Um, I did not get into other places. I got into Google, um, hmm. and that doesn't necessarily mean that Google was harder or easier than the other ones. It just might mean that like, I was a better fit for this, or maybe something else happened in the application process. That means like I like. Um, you know, I've been on the other side of things. Where we've been hiring for position, and suddenly like our funding got changed. So then we couldn't hire for that position. We just to tell some people no. It wasn't because they were bad. It's because like we didn't have money for them anymore. Uh, so things like that can also happen. Um, so yeah. So in terms of like general things, um, to um, I think it, it, you've probably heard this a lot. But like it, when you strike into the point of your resume, uh, keep it to one page. Keep it very clear. Uh, use action items. Um, make sure it's easy to read and understand. Um, it's like, don't go so like super crazy um, with it. Um, I think the other thing that I would recommend as you go forward, especially when you're in, you know, once you're in college and, and working afterwards, um, as much internships as you can get, really, really awesome. Um, unfortunately for tech, while they do appreciate academic stuff, the tend to focus more on practical things you've done. So if you're able to point to personal projects or internships you've worked with at companies or just anything that's other than just like pure academic stuff, that tends to be a really big booster for showing like I have the skills and like knowledge to be successful outside of the schoolwork. Wait, 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 I, I need you to repeat that point because our students need to hear that so loudly and clearly. Um, because it does seem like at, at York, there is so much focus on getting into the right school and, 
getting the right grades. And you know what, what, what I'm reading is consistent with what you just said. So I'd, could you kind of rephrase that or emphasize yeah. that? So, I mean, I, I think obviously like my schoolwork was really important um, sure. to like, and again, it's one of those things like, I think my GPA mattered as long as I was in academia. Like, I don't think I would have been able to get into a good college that I was happy with if I hadn't had, you know, a good grounding at York. I don't think right. I would have gotten a scholarship to get a free master's degree if I hadn't had good enough grades in my undergrad. But once I finished school, no one's ever asked about my GPA. No one's ever asked for proof of like work I've done in school. You know, like very few people even ask to see my diploma, like, like that. Um, it's right. kind of, it's like that. And then I, I think the expectation for other schools is like, yeah, like you should have a good academic grounding, but like, mm -hmm. every, like a lot of people have a good academic grounding. There's like, you know, there's thousands of graduates every year. What do you have besides that, that sets you apart that you can point to to say like, here's me being successful in a, you know, in, in a, in the context of the work that I'm going to be doing. Here's some ex examples of collaboration of work I've produced of like deadlines I've dealt with and things like that, that I can show to like, I will be good at this job if you give me the position. Um, so it's like, it's proof that you've done something and yeah. that you've, you've accomplished something. Yeah. Um, those other things are obviously really important, but uh, yeah. I, th I, th yeah, I think it's just so important that, uh, that the kind of projects that my students are doing right now is, is laying the groundwork, I, I hope for, uh, things that you can put on your resume that can prove, okay, yeah, I did, did well in these tests and I got into this nice school, but this is the problem that I've solved. Yeah, and, and especially with the UX thing, I think being able to say like, hey, like I went out into the community and tried to use technology to help directly make people's lives better mm -hmm. in a measurable or demonstrable way, like that's that's gonna always send a lot more than like a term paper you wrote or something. Like that's, that's yeah. something that will like make someone perk up and pay attention. Um, what is the uh, what's the market for UX uh, researchers? Is it is are there lots of opportunities for people who pursue that direction? Yeah, so UX as a whole is growing a lot. Um, uh -huh. I think it's again, I'd say in the last like from my understanding, like last ten years, um, there's been a more focus on like I, for a lot of reasons of just like wow, it doesn't have to just work; it has to be easy to use. Um, I'm sure we've all used apps or things that don't work well or work easy and it gets really frustrating. Um, and so I think there's an expectation as like more and more people use technology that it should be easy to understand, easy to use. Um, so I think as a result of that, more companies are trying to open up UX roles or have more focus on UX. It's definitely a lot more even in the last five years that I've seen. Um, I think the problem right now is a lot of them is people are looking for experienced people because the teams tend to, unless you're at a really big company, they tend to be smaller teams of researchers or UX people in general working on that. Um, but I think that's as, as the industry continues to mature and grow. I think that there'll be more opportunities for like intro and in, like opening level stuff and things like that. Um, you know, there's a, a bunch of different UX roles besides researchers. Again, there's designers, there's engineers. Uh -huh. um, even within design, there's a bunch of different types. You have like visual designs, you have interaction designs, you have voice designers, you have like a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, so there's lots of different ways to get into the field depending on what your personal interests are. Um, there's even like UX engineers, which are kind of a newer concept, but they're different than sort of traditional software engineers. Um, but it's people who yeah, are focused really on that, the front end user experience and not just creating good code. Um, so there's a lot of different areas. And I think there was another there's another visual I can probably share somewhere. And, and as you're going there, I just wanna um, give those who, who need to leave kind of the okay, you can go ahead and hop out. It's after 2.30. So if you uh, are here and you need, need to hop out, feel free. But uh, as I said, Blake, I'm gonna take advantage of as much of the yeah. time as you're willing to offer. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this, this is kind of like the breakdown of how like Google thinks about it. Um, so you have like kind of Google's companies divided into like tech and not tech. Uh, so tech, uh -huh. you system of the, the tech bubble. Um, you have things again, like so different products that are kind of separate within the organization. Once you drill into that within a product, you have different teams within a product. So like, for instance, like search can include shop, like, you know, search is something different, maps, shopping, YouTube are all different things. Once you drill into something else, you have things like engineering, uh, product teams, which are like PMs and things like that, and uh -huh. UX, where marketing is an overlap. And then within UX, you have things like, yeah, content strategists, designers, motion designers, program managers, engineers, you know, um, all these different things. And so it all kind of bubbles down into that all fits into the realm of UX. Um, so it's, it's, it, yeah. it's in almost, looks like everything that you do. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I realized I kind of sidetracked from the original question. Um, this was, this is like kind of like, the, this is the process I went through to get hired at Google. Um, it was about a four and a half month long process. That's so really long. Google takes a really long time to hire people. Wow. Uh, it goes very thoroughly on that. Um, so
So there's an initial screen with a recruiter to make sure you're like anywhere near a good match. Um, and this also includes like submitting your resume and like getting past the resume stage, which can be difficult um, as well because it gets there's some, you get like some number of like millions of applications per month at Google um, company wide. So there's a lot. Um, there's an hour long phone interview at the start where basically like I'm I, I speak I spoke to the researcher to talk about my experience and skills and things like that. Assuming you want to fair you an onsite. And that's a full day where you do a presentation to about six people and then have six one-on-one -on -one interviews for an hour each after that. Uh, so wow. it's very full. Um, assuming you get past that point, um, your packet gets sent before a hiring committee and they make a final decision about whether or not they want to hire you uh, based on all, all of the information from the previous stage. Um, and then if you get past that point, they make you an offer and you can go into the, neg the negotiation and team matching phase where you pick out which of the available teams you're interested in joining that are interested in you. Um, so yeah, that was for me. That was about four and a half months. I think start to finish. Um, I know some people have taken like five or six months. Um, Google again is on the extreme end for that. It, most companies do not take quite that long. Um, and did you? So when you find out found out that you were uh, given an offer, was that over email? Oh uh, yeah, I think yes. How did you yes, learn? Yes, it was, it was an email. Um, email that, was, that must have been a pretty exciting email to get. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, I, how much do you know about what it's like for software engineers at Google? Sure. Yeah. Software engineers have a pretty, uh, I can show you UX engineers, pretty similar. Um, it's, it's pretty similar. The biggest difference is they have some design exercises, uh, coding and or design exercises that part of it. Um, so obviously the questions asked are a lot more software specific. Um, they tend to have you do some more practical, like here's a problem, go like solve this in the next half hour and like walk me through your process, things like that. Um, but it, it's still like a pretty similar timeline and like somewhat similar like process. Mm, the software team on my robotics team did the same thing. The, to get you on, yeah, to yeah. Uh, have you be the yeah. software developer for the robotics team? Yeah, last year, like Seal made, made me write on a board how, how to solve a problem. Yeah, that's pretty common to my understanding, so. <laughs> So uh, yeah. I, I, I love thinking about the future. And when I get a chance to talk to smart people, I'm always curious about their take on the future. Um, one of my questions for you is, what scares you about our, uh, about the future based on your point of view? Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think in the short term, I think my big concern right now is I, I'm fairly convinced that once the coronavirus fear is calmed down, people are going to go back, trying to go back to normal. I think our this recession is going to hit fully, and then there's going to be a second wave of coronavirus breaking out as people as we like stop isolation too soon. Mm -hmm. uh, so I worry that like everyone's like freaking out now, and it's just going to be like worse in every way another six months from now. Um, that's kind of like that's my short term concerns. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think in my my long term things that worry me. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I was, as I'm, other people said this better than I like I could right now, but it's kind of like there's I think the disregard for science and authority has kind of waned in a really disturbing way. Um, mm -hmm. I think, especially looking at this coronavirus response, it's like a lot of people saw these things coming. Like we had systems in place four years ago to take better care of these things. And we've been kind of dismantling them and ignoring them in favor of short-term profits as a country. Um, and like, it's concerning that like, I hope the trend reverses itself because if we stay on the same track, we're like, we're ignoring good evidence and scientific method and, you know, proven, uh, like other examples of things going wrong in favor of like political agendas, that's obviously not a good thing. Um, yeah. So I, I see that I think it happens on the economic side. You see it happening with the environmental stuff, with human rights stuff. Um, a lot of different historical precedents I think are getting ignored in a worrying way. And that puts that puts Google in a pretty weird situation because you know Google is uh, basically the first place people go to get information, and so Google kind of is in that tough spot of being the arbiter of what is true and what's not true and yeah. uh don't always i get the sense that google doesn't doesn't necessarily want to be in the business of parsing out truth from fake news or whatever but uh yeah. they they are there and yeah. so you know how, how does one how does one deal with being in that tough spot yeah and and i think and I think there's been more of a shift, especially in the past four years. I think there's been a bigger call from employees to sort of say, like, we need to be better about not just being presenting information, but making sure that we're passing on good information. Mm -hmm. um, I see that come up a lot 
with the stuff I work on. So again, a lot of these projects I'm currently, you know, considering we're considering moving forward with. A lot of times, like if we're giving a travel recommendation or a food recommendation, a question comes up over and over again is like, why am I seeing this recommendation? What is this based on? Is this based on someone who's paying Google? Is it based on some review algorithms, based on something else? Um, and I think a big thing that I've been pushing for with all my teams is just like, whenever we give information, we need to be at least partially transparent about why we're giving that recommendation. So if we're yeah. saying like, hey, like here's a good travel tip, like, and this is because, it, you know, this is the reason we're showing this to you, not just like because we're Google. Um, because people, we, you know, the algorithm is a big opaque thing that no one really understands, especially not, not even within Google, but especially not for people who are just using Google products. Um, so, you know, just trying to be as transparent as possible about like, you know, like we can be, we can show you this thing, like we think this is the best thing. And like, if you want to find out more, here's a short version, or you can go to read more about it. And I think that's something that, yeah, for me personally, I try and push us to be doing. So at least like, if we're doing, if, if, we're, if we're recommending something, at least, you know, why we're recommending it and not just like, because we said so. And that's going to be harder in your products. I mean, in a, in a traditional search result, you know, you get a lot of information about how those results came up. But when you're just yeah. using Assistant, you're kind of you're often just getting a verbal answer. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because the Assistant experience can change a lot. So obviously, uh -huh. if you're on your phone looking at your phone, sometimes you can display stuff on your phone as well. If it's on a smart speaker, then yeah, you're just hearing what you're saying. If you have one of the new smart displays, which a lot of our users do, you can do both visual and audio stuff, but some of the people don't look at the visuals. So right, right. that is a big problem we have is just like, what's our right balance of being audio versus visual when we have the option? Like how, how do people use, like, and that's where understanding usage is really important. So a lot of the research we're doing is because they have a smart display at home. It's still very new is figuring out how often are people actually looking at the device? How often are they like interacting, they're touching it versus like on the other side of the room talking to it. All those things are things we're trying to really understand and get so that we can make sure that we're adjusting how we present information is doing so in a trustworthy and clear manner. Yeah. Well, it, it you know, right, this, uh, these past couple of months, it's, it's kind of a scary time to be a young person who's about to enter adulthood. Um, but I'm curious about some reasons you're excited about our future. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's a, a great question as well. Um, I, I think, the good news that I, I like I keep seeing from like you know people going up is that I think there's all this assumption that like oh no like if, if kids grow up staring at screens all day long they're gonna lose all these really dangerous like they're not gonna socialize properly they're gonna be mm -hmm. addicted to like fast content things like that et cetera et cetera and then I keep you know I keep a pulse on sort of psychology research going on and things like that um, and everything I'm seeing is that like people are you know that if nothing else that it potentially is enhancing their social abilities by having more social contact throughout the day even if it's a digital form people are getting slightly more you know tech literate and able to find information better on their own they're not you know they're they're younger people are willing to go out there and try and find information more than older people are because they have the tools and experience necessary to use these things like google or other you know other search engines or other technologies in general to find information um so i think rather than Again, I was kind of in the in between in between things where like I didn't have smartphones growing up. But we obviously had computers, and now like um, you know, it's now we have it's graduations who've grown up with touch devices in the beginning, and we didn't really know how that worked out. Um, but I think it, it seems like it's really positive where like there's a lot more understanding of how technology works and using it in positive ways rather than like just as any kind of negative stereotypes you can pull out of your hat. Yeah. Uh, our our uh, time together is is starting to close, but I want to open it up. Uh, any students or faculty members out there who want to ask a question? Anyone? Blake, I am so excited that you uh, gave us some of your time. We saw your calendar. We know how uh, how busy you are. I'm really grateful. Hopefully, uh, when we all come back to campus uh, that you'll come by for a visit, check out our shop and, and yeah. see what we're doing. We'd love to have you out. Yeah, I was I was actually already in talks with Chris to figure out like trying to do some like wider meeting at some point. Yeah. Was, that's an on indefinite pause still. Hey, like, hey Blake, I'm here. Yeah, I see yeah, you. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, obviously I think about to, Thanks for doing to this. How we can, you know, everyone could be back yeah. on campus together, things like that. But I think it's something definitely want to try and figure out once things are back to like in person's okay kind of uh situation yeah we need we need to talk about getting you on campus uh this is really really a great uh uh great experience for our students and for me and for all of us uh so good to see you out there congratulations on all the work that you're doing 
Thanks. Yeah, again, I, I just put my LinkedIn and my email. So if anyone wants to follow up with me personally, feel free to message me or email me. I'm happy to, I'm always happy to help out your students if there's anything I can do to answer questions or give advice or things like that. Feel free to yeah, ping me at any time. Um, uh, Francis, yeah. Dominic, any other students out there? Take advantage of this. Okay, I have a question. Um, yeah, sure. Francis. Um, I'm really interested in AI. Does Google do much with AI right now? Uh, Google does a ton with AI. A lot. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't personally work on it as directly, but obviously, assistant is a kind of like an offshoot of AI work. It's not the same as like DeepMind or things like sort of like the, the like hardcore AI stuff that we're doing. Um, there's also a lot of stuff going on in cloud, which is a really big growing area. Just all of our cloud computing different, like stuff is like a huge area we're investing in a lot of. Um, but yeah, there's a there's a lot of different ways to get involved, all the way from Waymo to cloud stuff to things like assistant. Um, so cool, Blake. Thank you so much again. And uh, for my students, check uh, Google Classroom for future projects. Or if you haven't yet put your most recent uh, program that you were asked to create, the uh, Branching Logic uh, program, please please post that in. Um, again, thanks, Blake. And uh, we look forward to, to watching watching you move forward. Thanks, Blake. We'll have you to campus as soon as we can. That's good. Okay, take care. All right. Everyone. All right bye. Thank you.